Hey folks, this is Kalani. There have been quite a few developments this week in the Dragonflight Alpha. The Draxia have already been nerfed, we have new class talent trees to look at, this week's Alpha build introduced a brand new zone, one more dungeon, as well as some updates to other features and systems. There's a lot to go through, so let's break it all down. Before we jump in, be sure to hit up that like button and subscribe so you never miss another video. To kick things off this week, the Draxia have had their first significant nerf. It didn't take them very long now, did it? It. So with this being focused on the Drakthea race instead of the Evoker class, it's nothing strictly related to character power, but the Saw racial has been nerfed quite considerably. The max speed for their flying used to be around 390%, but going into the next alpha build it will get knocked down to 640%, so they're losing almost 300% movement speed at that maximum velocity. That's going to be very noticeable and make soaring feel less impactful, and obviously you won't be able to go anywhere near as fast or as far with just your Draxia wings. It is worth noting that the max speed for actual dragon riding has not been changed, so it's only for the Draxia racial flying. The main reasons given for this nerf were, quite simply, it's too good, especially when compared to your other options in the old world. In any area where dragon riding is not enabled, Draxia have a significant advantage when it comes to moving around quickly. They compared it to our fastest epic flying mounts, which clock in at 400 10% movement speed, the only option non Draxia races have to really go fast. But there are two major problems that I see here. First, you're nerfing something fun because other races don't have access to it, but there's a much better solution here that brings everyone else up instead of squashing Draxia down. Just enable dragon riding everywhere. Pretty much everybody who's played with it on the alpha is asking for this. If players enjoy the fast paced, more active flying style, they can use dragon riding and have some fun. If they want to use the old flying for the passive style where they can go AFK for long flights in the old world, they would have that option as well. The main goal here should be giving more options, not nerfing restrictive options. Dragon riding would work incredibly well in the old world. I mean, it obviously already does because people are having a blast with it with their five minute saw cooldown on Draxia. The sheer potential here that is being wasted is, is actually kind of mind boggling. It also doesn't really seem to have any technical limitations in place because the Draxia saw works perfectly well, so it's an active choice to keep dragon riding exclusive to the Dragon Isles, which I think is uh, honestly a colossal mistake, and Draxia are already paying the price for that mistake. The second problem I see is that this only really affects old world content. Everyone is already on an even playing field for the Dragon Isles, so it's just older stuff where this problem crops up. The dev post mentioned things like chromie time quests, and pet battles, and clearing old raids for transmog. I don't know how much of an advantage Saw would really provide in many of those cases with its current cooldown, but with it only being leveraged in old world content, does a slight advantage even really mean that much, especially when it could be offset with our previously mentioned fix. Now I actually don't really think the nerf is going to be that bad. You mainly will only feel it when you're actively trying to do something fun with Saw, which is definitely going to be crappy after getting used to the previous speeds, but for the most part it won't change that much. Most use cases don't have you going super far with Saw, and the ones that do, well you can just use a flying mount to get the rest of the way I guess. So it is a large nerf to the overall potential of the ability, but it's probably not going to make that big of a difference in your day to day gameplay when Dragonflight comes out. I still think they should enable dragon riding everywhere though, and this nerf just adds one more reason to my very, very long list. Though I would still prefer if this nerf didn't go through. I don't think the reasons given are all that strong, and nerfing something fun instead of giving the other races more fun will always feel bad. Moving on, this week's build also introduced the talent trees for two more classes. The mages have their general tree and all three spec trees to go through. It seems like the response for mages has been, uh, bad. Their general tree is a bit of a mess, with lots of three point talents that restrict where and how far you can spread out, some major points are locked behind worthless points, and overall it's just kind of disappointing, especially when so many different effects could have made their way into the talent tree. For specializations, the fire tree was received the best, I think, the frost tree was a very mixed bag with very few new effects to work with, and lots of talent spent on getting back to their typical functionality, and then arcane was at least interesting, there are larger changes for arcane overall, so we'll just have to see how that all pans out. Remember that this 
this can change, and probably will, so it's not locked in just yet. And then Paladins were the other class with talents introduced this week, but they didn't get every tree, I'm afraid. They only got the General Tree, the Retribution Tree, as well as the Protection Tree. The Holy Talents will be added at a later time. The General Tree and Retribution Trees seem to have been received relatively well, especially when compared to the Mage Trees, but the Protection Tree doesn't seem to be fully functional. A lot of talents don't work properly, if at all, and there's a big shift in design for the most iconic Protection Paladin ability, Avenger's Shield, which has definitely left a lot of Protodins very disappointed. Apparently, Avenger's Shield should get the Silence effect back in a future build, but the Holy Power generation being removed is actually intended. They might backtrack on that later, but the current plan is to reduce the availability of Holy Power for Protection Paladins, so we'll see how that goes. And then as something to look forward to, the dev team have also said that they have a Priest update in the works. They're looking closely at feedback and will have something to share soon for all three Priest specs. So no matter what kind of Priest you love to play as, you should see some hopefully very interesting changes soon on the Dragonflight Alpha. Now I can't stress enough how fluid these talent trees are. We've actually had a lot of changes already. Evokers have had new talents added in, several talents moved around, reworked and even combined together in some cases. We have even more changes coming with the next alpha build for Evokers as well, so it's definitely an iterative process, which is great to see. I think talent trees being more open and way more flexible when compared to the old talent system also means the dev team have a lot of freedom for making changes. Whether it's to make a key talent available earlier in the tree, change up how you might progress through a tree, or just cut out some dead weight, they can make those changes very easily. Another good example for this are the Hunters. When their tree first came out, there were quite a few problem areas. The dev team recently went through some of the key points, how they feel about the feedback, and their current plans for addressing the main concerns. It's actually pretty detailed, so the discussion is definitely happening this time. Changes are being made. So what you see, especially in the very first build where your class tree is being made of available is definitely not the end result. We have months until Dragonflight's release date, so we will see many, many changes during that time. So don't write off these talents just yet. The new talent trees could end up being amazing. But think about what doesn't look good for you or feel great and give the dev team some feedback. That's the only way things are going to get better. Now as for new content to explore, this week's build introduced the Waking Shores, the first zone that we'll be jumping into when the Dragon Isles open up later this year. This is another relatively large zone, though not as quite as big as the Azure Span, with two main types of areas. There's the Green, Verdant, mountainous areas which make up the vast majority of the zone, and then there's the scarred lava strewn areas as well. Both of these areas are going to be fantastic for dragon riding just simply because of the verticality. You can go so far up and soar over the rest of the zone, it's really quite incredible. The lava areas are typically the more dangerous places where the ancient enemies of the dragons are stirring from their long slumber. There are also rivers and ravines crisscrossing around the zone, so it's all quite broken up, but it still feels very connected. It's really cool. There are also various towers and spires scattered throughout the zone which are incredibly fun to fly to and start dragon riding from, and this zone is also home to the Ruby Life Pools, which seem to be the Red Dragonflight's main hub in the Dragon Isles. The Life Pools are where eggs and whelps are taken care of, which makes it a perfect home for the Dragonflight that embodies life. The Waking Shores is also where the Black Dragonflight seat of power is, the Obsidian Citadel. Rathian is going to be very interested in this area as he tries to discover more about the Black Dragonflight and claim his seat as the Aspect of Earth. I'm sure it won't be altogether too easy for him though. It's a really cool area to work through, especially as an introduction experience to the Dragon Isles, to our new dragon friends, and it sets the scene pretty well. Now one very interesting thing about this zone, and I'll try not to spoil anything here, but there is a dragon who is quite important to the story, but the thing I'm interested in is that they turn into a Vulpira for their vicious form. We know that dragons can turn into basically whatever they want, we've seen humans, elves, gnomes, you know, it seems to be literally whatever they want. Now we have a Vulpira thrown into the mix as well. Something that is also very interesting, and that kind of bothers me, is that Drakthia are told that they should be able to take any form they want 
want as well. When you're learning how to use a vicious form, you're told it's about what you want to look like and what you feel inside. So having the in-game playable restrictions don't make that much sense. But here's the thing, maybe the dev team knows that and they have a plan. To start with, Drakthea can only use their current vicious forms, but then they learn and explore with these other new races and they might be able to take a different form. So later on, maybe in one of the later patches of the expansion or maybe even alongside the next expansion launch, who knows how long it would take, but maybe eventually they will open this up considerably and allow Drakthea to have any vicious form they want. I would actually prefer to be able to pick a vicious form rather than have the Drakthea customization options on the locked vicious form. I don't need scales if you let me be a blood elf or a night elf. I would be happy with their standard customization and then I just pop into a dragon for combat. That would be really cool. The option to pick a vicious form from any of the other races would be way more enjoyable in my opinion. And you never know, they could also potentially open up the class options for Drakthea later too. The potential is there, the lore already kind of supports it anyway, and I don't think players would really mind if they could play a dragon warrior or hunter or whatever else. So there is a lot of potential here, we'll just have to wait and see how the dev team wants to handle it. The dragons are already turning into new races, hopefully the Drakthea learn that ability as well. Now the Waking Shores is actually the zone where we learn dragon riding for the first time as well, so in the very first zone of our Dragon Isles adventures, we unlock our first dragon riding partner and we can take to the skies right away. That means we will also have dragon riding for the rest of the leveling experience and the rest of the expansion. So we do get it very, very early on, which is great because it's going to make leveling so much more interesting and fun. This build also introduced our first look at the dragon riding progression system. It's kind of like a small talent tree, which is very linear for the most part. From what we can understand, this system will use a collectible item called dragon glyphs. These glyphs can be found throughout the skies of the dragon isles, so you're going to have to keep your eyes peeled while you're soaring through the air. You can spend dragon glyphs to progress through the tree to unlock new abilities, more vigor points, faster regeneration, and then there are some spots that are just not implemented, so more options yet to come. I like the idea of the progression system not being tied to anything else. You can go out whenever you want, scout for glyphs, collect them using your super awesome dragon riding skills, and progress just like that. No character power, no dungeon or raid tie-ins, just you, your dragon partner, and the sky. That's really cool. Obviously it isn't finished yet, so I'll keep you posted on how this system progresses as the alpha builds come through. This build also introduced a new dungeon, the Ruby Life Pools. This was an incredible incredibly short dungeon, though it looked quite pretty. The dungeon is kind of the hatching spot for dragon eggs, it's where they are cared for and nurtured, and even where whelplings are reared, so it's a very important location on the Dragon Isles. So obviously it's a bad thing that some of the unsavoury folks around here have begun to assault the life pools. There were quite a few cool mechanics in the bosses here, the visuals were very impressive, and I think combined with the quick pace of the dungeon, this will probably end up being a favourite in Dragonflight, especially in the Mythic Plus scene. If you want to see a full run through of the Ruby Life Pools, you can find a link in the description below. In other news, Season 4 of Shadowlands starts next week. It kind of snuck up on us, really, though it is going live quite a bit earlier than many players were expecting. I know my guild was very rushed to try and secure their cutting edge achievement, which they did, so congratulations to them, but with Season 4 comes a new round of content. Or, or at least a, a bit of a refresh of content anyway. All three Shadowlands raids will become relevant again with the Fated Raid system, bosses will have special affixes you need to work around, they'll drop higher item level loot, and there are new rewards on offer like the slime cat mount. There's also a whole new pool of dungeons for the Mythic Plus system. We'll be revisiting the mega dungeons of past expansions, so that's Mechagon and Karazhan, as well as the Iron Docks and Grimrail Depot, because I guess they really, really wanted us to go back to Warlords of Janor and have some fun with the Gorgron dungeons. Tazavesh is also thrown in for good measure too. There's a new affix to play around with, higher item level loot to obtain, new rewards like the purple Deathwalker mount, and of course, you get to start the rating game all over again. Now there isn't really too much coming for PvPers or casual players though, which is quite a disappointment. If you want more info about the changes coming with Season 4, we have a video going over everything you could possibly need. You'll find a link to that in the top right corner of your screen right about now, or there will be a link in the description below. Whatever works for you. 
And then to round out this week's worth of news, there's also a change coming to barbershops in Dragonflight. They're completely removing their fees. So no matter what you get done at the barbershop, whether it's a tail adjustment, some scale painting, maybe a quick haircut, you know, they cover a lot of stuff these days. Maybe they shouldn't be called barbers anymore. But whatever you decide to do, it will all be free in Dragonflight. I hope the barbers are still getting compensated in one way or another. I'd hate for all the barbershops to shut down. But either way, it's now going to be free. Now, the barbershop experience has never really been terribly expensive, but if you chop and change things around often enough, it can definitely start to add up. Remember that the Drakthia do have a dizzying number of customization options available to them, so this couldn't really come at a better time. But that's all of the changes and updates this week in the alpha, and a quick roundup of some other news as well. What do you think of the Drakthia racial nerf? Was it too powerful before, or should Blizzard just let people have fun with something that has no real character power tied to it? Are you looking forward to the start of Season 4, are you waiting until Dragonflight to really get back into WoW? Leave all your thoughts in the comments section below. A big thank you to all of our supporters over on Patreon and to everyone subscribed on Twitch. You can see the names floating by on screen. If you want to see more videos like this, make sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you never miss another video. Thanks for watching folks, good luck and have fun, and as always I'll see you next time.